Hey everyone, it's Rob Ryder, and it's uh, Sunday, January 9th, 2022. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, today, notice Esquire's blank violates Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 11B. Request order imposing sanctions. So this video is about how we got there, because this is what we're trying uh, in a couple of different cases, and uh, I'm going to talk about it for a minute. But uh, this uh, Fed R C F P 11B, right? That's the legal citation of Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Right? It's just in case somebody wanted to know. Um, and then extra, after we get done with that, uh, just a little bit about forcible entry and detainer. Uh, by using some of what uh, I'm going to talk about from the notice of the Esquire violating uh, federal rule and see how we can use it, right? And, uh, you know, nothing's happened yet, but that doesn't stop me from talking about it. So that's what I'm doing. And I am Staff Sergeant Robert Allen Rolewski, U.S. Army veteran, also known as Rob Ryder. My email address is courtofrecord at aol.com. And hey, now I'm on Gab TV at Rob Ryder, R-O-B-B-R-Y-D-E-R. -B -B -E or will be soon. This would be the first video that I posted, so we'll see if it works. Okay, give me just a second here. And if you're a member of Gab and you've never seen my videos before, you stumbled across it, I have many more on YouTube at Rob Ryder, three Bs now, R-O-B-B-B-R-Y-D-E-R. -E um... You know, about all sorts of things wrong in the United States, from my point of view. And um, I've been at it for a number of years, right? So there's, uh, I must have at least 400 videos now. But, uh, you know, all, all the old ones really don't mean that much to me. They're just stepping stones on my own, trying to figure out what the hell is going on, right? And, uh, well, as I keep climbing that mountain, um, these are the things I'm down to now. And so here recently... I had done a video called Constitutional Question Ends Foreclosure, right, three months ago. And it was based on the fact that uh, a guy in New York had watched the video I had done prior to that, Notice the Constitutional Questions and Subpoena, and, you know, did what I had suggested doing, put it into his court case, into a foreclosure, and uh, the judge dismissed the case. Right now, the judge didn't dismiss the case specifically for what he had put the constitutional questions in for, but they, you know, she did explain what the plaintiff had done wrong, and it's, you know, it's all in this video here. It's pretty good, it's pretty good stuff. Anyways, uh, since then, the guy had been told that, uh, right, that what had happened in this case here in New York was monumental in the eyes of an esquire. So he had talked to an esquire or knows an esquire who knew what had happened, and that was the Esquire came and said to him that, you know, what you did in your court case is monumental. And that was, you know, simply getting a dismissal. So you can see how hard it would be to get a win, right, it's my, if it's monumental to even get a dismissal. But part of the thing is a dismissal is really like a summary judgment. And so it, there could be more added to it than that, and we don't ever get the other words in, maybe, and uh, yeah, on and on and on. So... This whole t progression is just trying to figure out what do you need to tell the court to make something happen. And the thing about the notice is that it wasn't a motion. It was a notice, right? And there's a difference between a notice and a motion. A motion is something that's happening in the court proceeding, right? Where a notice is something happening outside of the court proceeding about the court proceeding. Such as, in this case, this Rule 11 is about Attorneys needing to sign signature on the documents that they file. Well, if you just take a minute and start looking at the documents that any attorney files, they're not signing the document in their name. So they're violating this Rule 11, which, you know, it's Rule 11 under the federal rules of civil, civil procedure, and it'll be something else in your own state, but, uh, you know, every state will have some kind of rule that covers this. Uh, procedural step that has to be done that whatever it is that you're filing into the court case you have to sign and that there's you know rules on how to sign it so if they don't sign it if you notice the court about it then the court 
either has them, you know, sign the paper or they have to remove it. Well, if you were, you know, if you understand that for the very first piece of paper they put in, that it's been wrong because it wasn't properly signed, then there really isn't a court case because nothing has been signed. So, yeah, it's, uh, that's, you know, what we're dealing with. So this is what had happened in a particular case we're going to talk about now. So let me, uh, let me get to those documents. Hang on a second. Okay, so let's start with uh, Ratluski. He's just going to read what Rule 11 says, right? So just uh, bear with me and let me read some of this so we can all have an understanding of what it is we're talking about. This is Rule 11 out of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Signing pleadings, motions, and other papers. Representations to the court. Sanctions. <clears throat> Signature. Every pleading, written, motion, or other paper must be signed by at least one attorney of record in the attorney's name or by a party personally if the party is unrepresented. The paper must state the signer's address, email address, telephone number. Unless a rule or statute specifically states otherwise, a pleading need not be verified or accompanied by an affidavit. The court must strike any unsigned paper unless the omission is properly corrected after being called to the attorney or party's attention. Well, let's just... Go back and think about this for a second, right? Every pleading, written motion, other paper must be signed by at least one attorney of record. So the first thing they need to do is be an attorney of record. Well, how do you know if they're an attorney of record in the court case? Well, if they filed an appearance, right? To be in the court case, they had to file an appearance. And so, like in a federal court case, uh, let me see here, it's an appearance of counsel. Right, something in that I am admitted and otherwise authorized to practice in this court, and I will appear in the case as counsel for. Right, could be the plaintiff or defendant. It's not saying, but it could be for one or the other, and so you know it has to be for one or the other. And if you're self-represented, then you're taken care of. But uh, you know they have to file paperwork. So, yeah, hang on again. And then it goes on to say, in that attorney's name. So now the question is, well, what is your name? Right? Now there's a thing called the full legal name that's called out in the Real ID Act. And it says in the Real ID Act that your full legal name is the style of name you need to use in, you know, legal matters with the United States. Okay, well, if you're going to court, then you would think that would be covered. At least I'm gonna, I insist that it be covered, right? Because I insist... That whoever the uh, person bringing the charge is, right, has the authority to do so. <laughs> well, it starts with them signing the damn piece of paper. And so on any court case, if you go look, you're going to see that this has not happened. And normally what you'll see on the signature page, you know, <coughs> excuse me, we'll be looking at some in just a second, is there'll be a name of one attorney and then a signature by another attorney, like a byline. Well, that attorney didn't sign for himself. He signed for somebody else. And he didn't do it in his full legal name. And, uh, you know, check, check, check. All these things I say are wrong. I'm going to say they violated Rule 11 and file a notice in the court to have it checked out. Right? Because, uh, <laughs> B, by presenting to the court a pleading, written motion, or other paper, whether by signing, filing, submitting, or later advocating it, an attorney or unrepresented party certifies that to the best of its person's knowledge, information and belief formed after inquiry, reasonable under the circumstances, right, that it's not presented as an improper purpose and that the claims, defenses, and other legal contentions are warranted by existing law or by non-frivolous argument, right, by factual connotations or contentions, having evidentiary support, right, so evidence to back up the facts that are said. Or if there is no evidence, well, at least there's a chance there could be evidence. Uh, denials of factual contentions are warranted on evidence or specifically so identified as reasonably based on belief or lack of information. Right, so, well, they didn't sign it, so they can't have... Uh, because they didn't sign it, they can't say whether they agreed with any of these things or not. You know, from the beginning, it wasn't signed. 
So they can't say that it's not being presented for improper purposes. They didn't file it. They can't say the claims and defenses or the legal contentions are warranted because they didn't file it. You see what I'm saying, right? So they didn't do any of this. Well, then that comes down to sanctions. If after notice and reasonable opportunity to respond, <coughs> the court determines that Rule B has been violated, let's stop right there. Who gets noticed and who has to have a chance to respond? The court. Not the other party. The court. You notice the court that the other party violated the rule. Right? If after notice and reasonable opportunity the, to respond, the court determines that Rule 11B has been violated, the court may impose an appropriate sanction on the attorney, law firm, or party that violated the rule or is responsible for the violation. Absent exceptional circumstances, a law firm must be held jointly responsible for a violation committed by its partner, associate, and employee. Well, isn't that something? You can take them all down one swoop. So how do you get to that point? Well, you can either motion for sanctions or, let's go to three first, on the court's own initiative. On its own, the court may order an attorney, law firm, or party to show cause why the conduct specifically described in this order or in the order has not been violated by rule, has not violated Rule 11b. Okay, and then sanctions imposed under the rule must be uh, limited to what suffices to deter repetition of the conduct. Uh, similarly situated, the sanctions may be include non-monetary directives in order to pay a penalty into the court, or if imposed on motion and warranted for effective deterrence, in order directing payment to the movement of part or all of the reasonable attorney fees and other expenses directly resulting from the violation. Well, that could be uh, the occurrence of a tort. Right? That <coughs> um, you could get paid for a liability damages. You know, $1 million for occurrence for malicious prosecution. Hey, that's what we're going after. <coughs> and, and, and. So, you know, so why... So why am I looking at this now is because of what happened here in the last couple of weeks. Um, but I want to put on one other thing. Here's the thing. There's a motion for sanction, and here's the court doing it on its own, right? Well, how is the court going to do it on its own? Well, by you giving it notice, right? Talked about giving notice up here. Um, if after notice and reasonable opportunity to respond, the court determines Rule B has been violated, well, how what would they be doing? Well, they would be sending an order to show cause to the other party to come in and prove why they didn't violate Rule 11B. Or not prove. Right? And so now the judge, because it's a notice and it's not really happening as part of the court case, it's happening, you know, because of the court case, but it's not a judicial procedure like a motion is. A motion is one of the procedures that's done in a, in a you know, <laughs> in a court case. And a notice is something that's being done because of the court case, such as the people violated Rule 11b. Well, now, in that case, the judge gets to be the trier of the fact and the law. Whereas if it's a motion, they don't get to be the trier of the fact. Right? Because your case could be heard by a jury, and the jury gets to try the fact. So you're doing it outside of the court case. You know, just to me, it's a better place to do it because it's administrative instead of judicial. To have them find out how come the attorney firm isn't signing their papers. Right? And so this has all happened because of, you know, something that's almost as interesting as this, this rule. And we're going to talk about that next. Okay, so again, if you went back to YouTube and went to finding the lesser magistrates and update correction lesser magistrates, because in this video I had said that the seal was the seal of uh, the District Court of the United States, which was incorrect. It's actually the, the seal of the District Court of the State of Michigan, which is what is actually said on the seal. Right? But, uh, anyways, I was talking about this case where I'm helping a lady uh, who had an IRS issue, right? and that you know I had decided from what I read, well, what I want to do is I want to take it to the state court and call it a malicious prosecution because... 
when you look at the paperwork that they're saying you know, that makes you owe these taxes, they have errors and omissions in them, and you know they're fraudulent. So it's a malicious prosecution, right? So that was the angle I wanted to try, and so we filed a case into her local district court, and uh, they, they being the government, the federal government, whoever you want to call it have now moved the case to the district court, right? The United States District Court. Well, you know, now, in the local court, it cost her $35. It cost Tammy like $35 to open this case against the United States. And now it's been moved to the court where if she had tried to open it there, it would have been a $500 case, right? So she got it, uh, you know, for 35 bucks. So it's, you know, more like... Uh, you know, petitioning the government for redress of grievances than paying for a court case. So let's look at what happened. Hang on. Okay, so this is what we had filed. I need that page. Here's the summons, right? For Tammy's the plaintiff in the United States is clearly the defendant. Care of these addresses, which I talked about where they came from and how I had them in the video, right? So those addresses. Uh, there's no other pending result. Uh, you know, check the box. Does that apply? Uh, in the name of the people of the state of Michigan, right? Now, that's that term has to be on a summons. And so, actually, there's if you look, you can find the rules in your state that say what needs to be on the summons. And as you read this thing here, it says that this document must be sealed by the seal of the court. <laughs> but there's no court seal on it. Right? There's no court seal. Whereas we get down here to the complaint, which is the same, da da da. We did it as an affidavit, right? It has a court seal, and that court seal says this: the District Court of the State of Michigan. So it doesn't say 84th District Court, which we'll see is what they're claiming. You know, the court that this was entered into. No, this is the District Court of the State of Michigan. The Michigan legislature only created one court, one district court, and then they split the state up into 90-some judicial districts. And I'm sure most states have the same type of thing. You have something where the state has been split up into judicial districts. You're in one of them, and that judicial district is part of the one, you know, Supreme Court or whatever the term is we need to use for the state court. But instead of going to that court when we go, right, they're taking us to this thing they call like the 84th District Court, which isn't a court that was created by the state legislature. Right? It wasn't created by Michigan. It was created by state of Michigan, the corporation. It's a corporate court. But it's not the du jour state of Michigan where state is merely, you know, pointed out that it's an organized uh, uh, member of the union. Right? Instead of the name being State of Michigan, it's, uh, you know, which is the other one they use where they actually have a name of something called State of Michigan. Well, that's not the government. They want you to believe it is, but it's really not the government. So, hang on. Okay, and so you don't have to go watch the other video if you haven't watched it yet, right? So, the gist of this is the complaint was that, um, you know, first establishing who. Tammy is, right? But then uh, get down to this, where with the IRS, they, they publish this manual. It's called the Document 6209. If you were to Google Document 6209, you could find this exact manual I'm talking about. It's put out yearly, right? It's actually on the IRS website. It's probably the best place to find it, right? IRS.gov. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's got these different sections in, and in section two, it has the different kinds of tax returns and forms. And then there are clearly identifies as a W-2 wage and statement, a wage and tax statement. It's a tax class five document. And that a 1040 U.S. individual tax return, you know, the form that you do, is used for reporting tax class two or six information. In other words, you know, it has nothing to do with tax class five, which is what the W-2 is. Well, so are 1099s, right? So anything that has tax class 5, there's no reason for it to go on a 1040 form because a 1040 form is for tax class 2 and tax class 6. 
right? But if you don't, you know, do it that way, they're going to come after you for some reason, right? They're going to have their, because they don't care. They're not doing it right anyways, right? Until you figure out what to do about it, they're going to continue with their scheme. Well, this is, you know, my attempt to try to, you know, crack that nut and say, well, look, the W-2s for 10 tax class 5, the 1040 forms for tax class 2, so I don't owe you any, any income tax. Or Tammy doesn't. <clears throat> Right, and then in section four, it says the document locator number identifies tax class two as individual income tax. Well, that's what we're supposed to be paying, right? And at tax class five is information return processing, estate and gift tax, which is not income tax, right? Because they have one for income tax. Individual income tax is class tax class two. Right, it's a fact that the compensation identified on W-2 is not taxed as individual income tax, and the plaintiff has no source of tax class 2 income to report on a 1040 form. Right, because she just has one job, gets a, gets a W-2. Well, then don't put it on a 1040 form. Right, it's a fact that the plaintiff has received numerous documents mailed by defendant's agents that prove that the use of false records is simply the legal process. You know, and, and so I covered all this in the other video. I'm not going to go through it. I'll just take too long. But that's what we filed in. But just to show you, here's, uh, you know, Section 2. And if you go down here, here's a W-2, wage and tax, right? Number 5 in the tax class. Uh, here's a 1040, tax class 2 and 6. You know, what's different? There's no number 5. And I didn't put the 1090s in because this is many pages long, but you know, all the 1099s are all tax class 5. There's absolutely no reason to put any of that information on a 1040 form. Right, and then this is at section 4. And right, here's the format. There's the tax class, the third document, or third number. And here's the different ones that it does. And 2 is individual income tax. Well, that's pretty clear. And 5 is information return processing, estate, and gift tax which is not tax class two. And then, you know, the papers that they lied on. And, and then, you know, this was the my cause of action then. was It was a malicious prosecution, which they had a statute in Michigan that if you claim it, right, every person who shall for vexation, trouble, maliciously cause or procure any other person to be arrested, attached, or any way proceeded against uh, by any process or sit uh, or civil or criminal action, or in any other manner prescribed by law, to answer to a suit or prosecution of any person without the consent of such person, or where there is no such person known, shall be liable to the person so arrested, attached, or proceeded against, in trouble the amount of damages and express, which by any verdict shall be found to have been sustained and incurred by him, and shall be liable, right now this is an addition, and shall be liable to the person in whose name such arrest proceeding was had in the sum of $200 damages, and shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor, punishable under conviction by imprisonment in the county jail for the term of not exceeding six months. Well, because it uh, said it was a misdemeanor, um, or actually because it's a malicious prosecution, which is a tort, um, I couldn't, it appeared that we couldn't do this under small claims court, so we did it under the general district court. But still, because the damages are only $200, in Michigan it's like a $30 filing fee for a $200 claim in the general court, and then you got to pay for your service, right, which is to certified mail to two different addresses. And so we did all that and made the United States the plaintiff, or excuse me, the defendant, well, the, you know, now what's happened is the United States has taken the case and moved it to the federal court. Right? But, you know, and so, you know, the reason for doing it this way is because of this right here, $200 damages. It gives you a sum certain to put on your document that you're coming after them for. But your, your real relief will come from this in trouble, the amount of damages and expenses, which by any verdict, shall be found to have been sustained and incurred by him, right? The first part of that sentence is where, like, uh, liability insurance for the occurrence of a malicious prosecution is. Penal 
damages. You know, whatever the court wants to give you. All right, so. But this is why we put it into the state court, because we had this, you know, this Michigan law. Let's go ahead and put it in and see what happens. Well, what happened? They ended up moving it to the federal court. So let's see how they did that. Hang on a second. Okay, so um, we filed that on like the 17th of November, right? And it's waiting, waiting to see what's going to happen and waiting for the service to get done and so forth and so on, which that's a whole other story in itself. But at the end of the day, on the 29th of December, so, you know, about six weeks, five, six weeks later, the case is getting moved from the state court to the federal court. You know, except, except for the fact, well, they may have changed the thing or two. Right, like they're using in the United States District Court for the Western District of Michigan Southern Division. You know, that's really not the name of the court, but it's okay. This is their paper. This is what they did. And in these federal cases, uh, in case you've not seen this before, I mean, you're doing one, right? You got this page ID number. What it says in the local rules is if you're going to, you know, talk about a particular page of our, you know, something in the court case, they want you to do it by page ID number. Right, so that's where that is. And it's just a one-page thing, right? This is the, the this is what they did first. And this was, like I said, a, you know, a week ago or so. Uh, pursuant to Title 28, United States Code 1441, 1442. We'll come back and look at these in a minute. There isn't that many. And, you know, they all tie together. But this is what they said. Because of those, the defendant, United States of America, you know, again, it's supposed to be United States, but that's what they're saying. Hereby removes this action from the state of Michigan's 84th District Court in Lake City to the United States District Court for the Western District of Michigan. You know, now I don't agree with everything they said, but this is what they said they did. All right, this case comes within uh, 1442A1 because it's a civil action that has commenced in the state court as against the United States or an agency thereof. The court has subject matter jurisdiction under 28 U.S.C. 1341 and or 1441F, although the United States is not conceding there is statutory waiver of sovereign immunity for the action. In accordance with 28 U.S.C. 1446A, copies of all proceedings, pleadings, and other important orders served on the United States in this action, as of the date of the notice of removal, are attached. The notice of removal is timely under 28 U.S.C. 1446B, and pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1446D, the United States will provide the state of Michigan's 84th District Court and all other parties with proper written notice the filing of this notice of removal. All right, then it got to the signature page. Well, I'm saying by Rule 11, this is wrong. I don't really care what they say anymore. Well, you know, get back to what they said. But this is wrong. All right, this is like uh, Edward is signing for David, like a byline. Although it doesn't say buy here, but I have seen what they do put buy in front of it. They don't hide it sometimes. Right? But David didn't sign it. His name's on it. But, but hey, these really aren't their name because you don't have a middle initial in your name. Your full legal name is your first name, middle names, last name, no initials, no nicknames. Right? The name that's on your um, birth record. And that isn't either of these. So, you know, if there was nothing else to go on, you could use that. Okay, but let's go back and look at what they said they were doing. All right, so 1441, 1442. That's 31. 1441, removal of civil actions. Okay, so except as otherwise expressly provided by Act of Congress, any civil action brought in state court for which the district courts of the United States have original jurisdiction may be removed by the defendant or defendants to the district court of the United States, for which district the division embracing the place where such action is pending. Well, apparently that's what they did. Okay. Um, and that talks about 1442. A1, so we'll take a look at that too. <clears throat> Actually, it'll get back to this later, but eventually it's going to go back and talk about this app, right? That maybe this is where the jurisdiction comes from. 
right? Derivative or removal jurisdictions. So this is start, you know, part of the same thing. 1441, removal of civil actions. The court to which the civil action is removed under this section is not precluded. So in other words, it is not stopped from hearing and determining any claim in such civil action because the state court from which the civil action is removed did not have jurisdiction over that claim. Right, so even though they're saying it came out of the 84th District Court, which doesn't exist, the fact that they brought it, to, they brought that claim to this court, this court can have jurisdiction over the matter, even though the court that, that, was, that they said it was in never really had jurisdiction in the first place. I mean, they, you know, in other words, they're handing you the, the proper jurisdiction that can make a decision. Now, again, this had nothing to do with, you know, Tammy or, or what I put in. This is what they did. They being the people that put in this notice, are the ones that did this, right? They put it in there. They moved it. Okay, uh, this case comes within 1442A. One, okay, well, does it? Let's find out. What would that mean? 1442A, a civil or criminal action or prosecution that is commenced in a state court and that is against or directed to any of the following may be removed by them to the District Court of the United States for the district and division embracing the place where it is pending. Right? So who? who? The United States. Or any agency thereof or any officer. Well, that's what they did say. The United States or any agency. I'm going to say it's just the United States. I didn't do it to an agency. I did it to the United States. But the important thing is they're saying that you can make the United States a party to a criminal action, to a prosecution. Right, so you can make them the defendant, animal, and uh, the United States a defendant in a misdemeanor case, which is basically what we're doing. Right, because if they're found guilty of a malicious prosecution, well, it's a misdemeanor. Okay, then what happened? All right, so then uh, subject uh, 1341. So the court it has subject matter jurisdiction. Under these, uh, either 1341 or 1441F, which is the one I talked about, even though the state court doesn't, you know, this court can have it. Or they said 1341 is the other place to get it from. Or what does that say? Taxes by states. The district court shall not enjoin, suspend, or restrain the assessment, levy, collection of any tax under state law. Okay, well, that isn't what it is, because this is a federal. We're talking the IRS, not the Treasury of the state of Michigan. So, you know, I mean, it's all lining up where, you know, they're telling you how they, um, that by moving this here, they've given the court jurisdiction under 1441. So even if the court, if the case was bogus before, because it wasn't really filed in a proper court, now it is. In accordance with uh, 1446A, copies of all proceedings, pleadings, orders served. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, a problem with that is, Let's just go down and take a real quick look. Is they slid this civil cover sheet in here, which isn't something that we gave them. I mean, this is where it starts with what we had filed into the court case. We didn't put this in there, but they put it in under this rule like it came from us as part of what they had been served. Uh, 1446A. So, uh, procedure for removal of civil action. So, generally, a defendant or defendants desiring to remove any civil action from a state court shall file in the District Court of the United States for the district and division within which such action is pending a notice of removal signed pursuant to Rule 11. Ah, that's the one I decided to go look and see what Rule 11 had to say. Of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and containing a short and plain statement on the grounds for removal together with copy of process pleadings and other orders served upon such defendant or defendants in such action. Well, what they didn't get served is this uh, civil cover sheet, which, you know, which has errors in it, which is why I don't want to take claim it. But this is where it said, you know, I had to do it by, per Rule 11. And, well, we've already seen what Rule 11 says, so they violated it. <clears throat> right? Because they didn't sign it. Because, as we'll see, we'll look at the other documents in this case, they haven't filed a uh, notice of counsel. 
Did I show that yet, what that looks like? Appearance of counsel? Something like this, right, to show that they're appearing for counsel. If that isn't in the record, well, then they're not the attorney of record. Right? You put, you know, you put the court on notice. Say, hey, they didn't, there, no counsel's appeared yet. There's nothing in the record. Hang on a second. Okay, and then the rest of this is just uh, all has to do with 1446 and these different sections that they're doing it for, which uh, 1446, where I looked at A, I said B, generally the notice of removal of civil action or proceedings shall be filed within 30 days after receipt by the defendant. You know, I've got to go check the dates, but okay. And then it said D, which is notice to adverse parties uh, promptly after filing of such notice of removal of a civil action. The defendant or defendant shall give written notice thereof to the adverse parties and shall file a copy. Yeah, okay, well, they did send something. So, you know, like they're, they seem to be acting like they've actually moved it properly, except uh, they're not signing their paperwork. In accordance with, and again, this is, you know, 1446, signed pursuant to Rule 11. It's pretty clear. Okay, so let's look at some of the other things they put in, right? This is the first thing they put in, is this notice of removal. Well, now we got to go look closer. And then they put in the civil cover sheet where they've changed the defendant to the United States of America. They do have the U.S. government as the defendant, which is good, but they changed the nature of the tort or the suit, which should have been tort, right, to it being a federal tax suit and uh, removed from the state court. That's okay. And then uh, they're saying the cause of action is 28 U.S.C. 1442. When it isn't, it's, uh, you know, MCL, Michigan Compiled Law, 600-2906 or something like that. You know, the one for malicious prosecution. But because this is stuck in here, like, you know, it's supposed to be in the packet of stuff they got from us, they could say, well, that's what you said. So, yeah, you know, it's errors upon errors upon errors. Well, then a certificate of service that they sent it to Tammy. Yeah, that looks good. But, you know, again, we got the same problem. Every page looks just like this. Got David H. Hubert and Edward J. Murphy. All right, same, same, same. Right. Except this one. This one is only clerk of the court. All right, so that isn't her, her, somebody's uh, signature either. We don't know who this is. All right, they didn't sign this paper. If this is supposed to be in the court case, it hasn't been signed properly either, just like anybody else under Rule 11. This was done wrong. Uh, but, you know, this is saying that they assigned it to Robert J. Jocker, and he is the <laughs> chief judge of the district court, so the, you know, chief judge is watching the case. And again, you know, this all just happened, late, you know, in the last week, so um, where they can file things electronically, we have to file everything by mail. We filed a notice into this, but it hasn't shown up in the docket yet. But all these things are being addressed in there. Now, look at She filed in the United States District Court, Western District of Michigan, Southern Division. Or this one is in the United States District Court for the Western District of Michigan, Southern Division. If you want to believe those two courts are the same, that's up to you, but they ain't to me. You know, I'm not letting them get away with that. Now we're back to the end, though. And they requested, uh, they wanted more time, yada, yada, yada. Got the same thing going on with the signatures. So, consistently, they have not signed anything. <laughs> right? They've not really put anything into the court case. Well, they've, you know, they've done it by violating Rule 11. And so now the court can sanction them. And that's what we're headed to. That's what we're asking for. Right? So, it doesn't really matter what they said. This certificate of service, they got it in, you know, uppercase and bold. Blah, blah, blah. Be afraid, be afraid. But at the end of the day, I didn't sign it. Oh, well, the judge signed his. Uh, what did he do? But he signed for the wrong court. 
Okay, he's, he filed two different orders. Here's order of reference and order for enlargement of time. This one is in the, in the United States District Court for the Western District. This one is uh, United States District, you know, not for the Western District. And this is uh, Chief United States District Judge. And this is United States District Judge. All right, Chief United States District Judge versus United States District. Okay, that part is the same, but and one he's the chief, the other one he isn't. So, you know, there's lots going on. So we'll find out what they're going to do with what we put in. But, you know, basically this is what we put in. All right, into the United States District Court, Western District of Michigan, Southern District. Using, you know, what they, whatever they call the court case, you know. I'm saying the defendant's United States, but they had the United States of America, so I'm not going to change, I'm going to leave it. Where we said the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure says this, right, that every pleading, written motion, or other paper must be signed by at least one attorney of record in an attorney's name. So, number one, there is no attorney of record as neither individual named on page ID 2 of this proceeding has filed an appearance of counsel. The style of the name used by these individuals is not their full legal name and is insufficient as identification for conducting official business of the United States. Edward J. Murphy and David A. Hubert are in contempt of this court for impersonating as officers of the United States in violation of 18 U.S.C. 912 unless they can prove by record or certificate that they executed the oath in an act to regulate the time and manner of administering certain oaths. That'd be your 1 Stat 23, very first statute of the statutes at large, which are the laws of the United States. Right? That's the act that contains the oath that satisfies the sixth article. It says so in the act. And nobody's nobody is executing this oath. So if David J. Murphy and or Edward J. Murphy and David A. Hubert want to represent the United States, they have to have executed this oath. If they didn't, well then they're impersonating officers of the United States, which is what 18 U.S.C. 912 is. Impersonation of officers of the United States. Uh, as required by all judicial executive officers of the United States and several states to satisfy the Sixth Amendment Constitution of the United States. That's what it says. Secondly, the identity of the defendant was converted from the United States to the United States of America. On page ID 1, 3, and others, the United States of America is not the United States and has no legal standing to act as the United States. It is a conspiracy against the United States to conceal its existence with the foreign jurisdiction of the United States of America which is King George's jurisdiction, his successors, right? The crown. That's where the esquires come from. Esquires are crown agents. Esquire is not a title of nobility. They're not nobles, right? They're not a knight. They carry the knight's shield. Well, guess who cleans the stable? They'd be the misters, right? So an esquire always wants you to be a mister, which is why I'm always Staff Sergeant Robert Allen Berluski. Because you ain't calling me a mister. All right, so if you've got, if you've got a title other than mister, you should use it. Or at least they don't call me mister. Uh, thirdly, the notice of removal. Page ID 1 falsely claims the civil action was removed from the state of Michigan's 84th District Court in Lake City, disregarding the fact that the original action was filed in the District Court of the state of Michigan as evidenced by the court seal, right? By this little seal here. That's on the affidavit that made up the complaint that got filed into the court case. There's nothing on there that says 84th District Court. It says the District Court, State of Michigan. They don't have an answer for that. You know, that's when they go silent. Uh, right, so it did not come from the State of Michigan's 84th District Court. That court does not have a seal. Oh, yeah, in fact, I said that. The 84th District Court is not a state court created by the Michigan legislature. And it has no court seal to prove its existence in the United States as a competent tribunal. Finally, civil cover sheet, that'd be that page ID 3, was not filed by the plaintiff. This document falsely claims the nature of suit as a federal tax suit instead of a tort for miscellaneous prosecution. The cause of action is not 28 U.S.C. 1442. The cause of action is Michigan Compiled Law MCL 62907. 
malicious prosecution or action, civil liability penalty. We need to be precise. Page ID 13. Further, the plaintiff's county of residence is Masaki County, Michigan, a political subdivision of the United States, and not the unorganized territory county of Masaki, as appears on the civil cover sheet. <laughs> plaintiff is a citizen of the United States, residing in an organized state of the United States, and is at all times protected by the Constitution of the United States, the supremacy of the laws of the United States and all courts in the United States, such as this tribunal. Right? Take judicial notice. The Constitution is supreme. And you read the sixth article, and it says all the laws that passed <coughs> the treaties, the this, the that, those are all the supreme law of the land. So what's the conclusion? Well, the agents of the United States of America, that the Esquires, are impersonated as judicial officers of the United States and simulated in a legal process under color of law as part of a scheme intended to deprive the plaintiff of life, liberty, and property, rights, titles, and interests without due process of law in offense of Amendment B of the Amendment 5, <coughs> Fifth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States and in violation of Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 11B. Plaintiff requests that on the court's initiative, it sanctions the attorneys and law firm and provide relief. Because the court doesn't need me to file a motion. It just needs to know what happened. It can do it. And we're hoping that's what happens. Okay, so, I mean, Tammy got uh, USPS tracking to show that it has been delivered to the court, got delivered on Friday. And I've looked on pace or hasn't posted yet, but... You know, I'm expected to post on Monday, and then it's game on. We'll see what uh, we'll see what uh, Chief Judge Jonker has to say about the situation. So, okay, so really, that's it for this, right? This all again, this all happened because of them, whoever them are. Which, if you notice, these guys aren't claiming. That's not what they, these guys aren't claiming to be. Um, He's the assistant attorney, attorney general. That's good enough. But uh, trial attorney, tax division. All right, I don't see where they're claiming to be the United States attorney. All right, so, you know, they got the tax attorneys over here. So, interesting. All right. But these are the people that moved the case, and now it's in federal court, and we've, you know, the very first piece of paper we put in was a notice to say that they didn't sign their, their very first piece of paper, and we'll see what the judge has to say. And, um, and because they did that, it's like, okay, well, I still want to file something, right, and, you know, into the state court and have the same thing happen, and so what can I file? And, you know, but I really didn't want to have to, I didn't want to do it in the district court. I wanted to do it in small claims court. So we're going to look at that in just a second. Uh, just one more thing before I forget. I don't remember if I showed this right. On the summons form, it, it has this particular... Sorry. I wanted to show... So, you know, this is what they're supposed to use for if uh, you're being served for some kind of civil action in Michigan is this summons form. And, it, you know, it has this particular information on it. But... More than that is if somewhere in your state's laws, right, or civil procedures, or whatever you want to call it, is the things that have to do with the, what needs to be on a summons, right? So, in other words, a summons must be issued in the name of the people of the state of Michigan, right? In the name of the people of the state of Michigan, state's capitalized, Michigan's capitalized, in is capitalized, everything else lower case, and under the seal of the court. And it has to have all these attributes, right? So... Let's go back and look at this thing real quick. All right, there it is in the state, uh, in the name of the people of the state of Michigan. That's proper. And it says here that there has to be a seal on it, but they don't put a seal on the summons. Right, so nobody's ever being properly summoned to court because the summons isn't being done right. And I wasn't sure if I pointed out in this video or not. But I've actually almost, I did this whole video once, had my microphone turned off. So I'm redoing it, and uh, hopefully I'm not covering things too many times to make sure I covered them. Okay, hang on a second. 
Okay, so again, this is the one with malicious prosecution, right? And uh, because malicious prosecution is a tort, an intentional tort, in Michigan, you cannot take it to small claims court. So I said, you know, I really can't use this one, but I wanted to use small claims. So I was going to keep looking. But, so I started looking for something that had, you know, a damage number like this one does in it to say, okay, well, as long as it's not a tort, it has a, some certain damage, then I can use that in the case. And what I found was uh, damages for forcible entry and detainer, right? Uh, da, 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 da. And really, it's just this first section. Any person who is ejected or put out of any lands or tenements in a forcible or unlawful manner or being out is afterwards held and kept out by force is entitled to recover three times the amount of his or her actual damages or $200, whichever is greater, in addition to recovering possession, which is the important thing, right? Because uh, we've been dispossessed of our tenements. And so we should probably go look at a definition now to see what that means, but Oh, wrong one. All right, what's a tenement? In law, any species of permanent property that may be held as land, houses, rents, commons, an office, an advowson, a franchise, a right of common, a peerage. These are called free or frank tenements. Well, you have an electoral franchise, right? And you're supposed to hold the office of elector. And uh, there's things that have been given to me because I was a veteran, or that I am a veteran, I served my country, that I'm not getting. And they took my name from me. They stole my identity, right? It should be Robert Allen Redluski, but they got me as Robert A. You know, on and on and on. It's like, yeah, those are tenements. Well, I want, it, you know, I want possession of my tenements. I have a Social Security account. It has my name on it, Robert Allen Redluski. But they're acting like it's really not mine, like it's, you know, theirs. Well, that's because for some reason there's a screw up in the frickin' records, right? Well, I want it fixed. Well, you know, I say all this stuff was done on purpose. So this is what I did. Hang on a second. Well, let's just first read this uh, definition of what a forcible entry and detainer is, right? It's a summary proceeding to recover possession of land and tenements that is instituted by one who has been wrongfully ousted or deprived of possession. Forcible entry detainer, one aspect of which is known as unlawful detainer, alludes to two separate misdeeds and two divergent remedies of statutory origin. A forcible intrusion into another person's peaceful possession constitutes one type of infraction. Even if it is unlawful, peaceable possession cannot be terminated by violence. In many jurisdictions, even the rightful owner is held liable for damages which as provided by statutes are often multiple in nature. If he or she employs excessive force and ousting one in a peaceful uh, possession. In such instances, the off offense involved is the force itself and not the actual dispossession. Uh, the second form of misdeed entails an initiation of legal proceedings by the rightful owner against the squatter without title or a tenant who declines to depart. Force in such instances may be inconsequential, figurative, or non-existent. Damages are avoidable, but the restoration of the lawful owner to possession of the property by eviction of the defendant is also within the purview of the remedy. This remedy, which awards both damages and possession, resembles ejectment, which also entails the recoupment of possession of property by the person entitled to it. But significant differences exist. And on and on and on, right? So da 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 da. It's not ejectment. It's like ejectment. So you know, hey, forcible entry detainer. It's not quite. Uh, oh, we should one more. In addition to historical dis dissimilarities, the summary nature of a forcible entry and detainer action is unlike the nature of ejectment action. The trial. And eviction can be accomplished within a few days after service of process. Statutes frequently provide, however, that the decision in forcible entry or unlawful detainer is not binding as to title. If the title is seriously disputed, a second, more comprehensive suit in ejection or trespass is warranted. Right? And so trespass is another one of those intentional torts. 
So this, you know, this thing isn't quite an intentional tort because I have title. We're just, you know, they're acting like I don't have any interest. Right? The, the title is in my name. That, that social security account says Robert Allen Rutluski. I have title. I just don't have possession of it. Like they're saying, I don't have interest in that account. Well, that's, you know, where they're incorrect. They're not recognizing my interest. And so we'll get their asses kicked out. <laughs> so hang on again. Okay, so first of all, let's look and see what it costs to do this, right? This is uh, my local court and small claims uh, up to $600. So that's 30 bucks, right? So for $30. And then we got service fees by court, small claims only, right? So the court will serve your papers on the defendant for $10. There we are. Okay, so that's, you know, that took care of that part. Now, let's see what we did. In Michigan, they have this, you know, it's it's probably the same in most states. They got some little book that tells you how to do things in small claims. Right? And so, I say the thing you're looking for, just where I get off of this and don't get back to it for some reason, is... Um, Right, damages for forcible entry and detainer. Right, forcible entry and detainer. Just Google that, whatever the name of your state is, forcible entry and detainer. And you would be, you know, if you were doing what I was doing, that's what you would be doing. And here's the thing I'm doing mine on. <laughs> so whether it's the district court, small claims court, whatever, wherever it says to do it, right, you're just going to make the United States the would, well, the United States would be the defendant. I'm not telling anybody to do this. You know, let's just start there. I'm just doing it, and I'm just talking, right? But if you were going to do it, that's what you would do is make the United States the defendant and say that it's their fault. Okay, so, again, it's just, uh, you know, you can find a booklet that tells you how to do it. And one of the things it says in this booklet is... Uh, all right, you cannot use small claims to uh, the district court if your case is against state of Michigan or state agency. Well, it's not. It's not against the local government. No. Uh, you're an assignee, third party. No. And uh, you filed more than five claims this week. No, I haven't done any of those. So I guess the United States is okay to have as a defendant. So this is what it looks like, right? Um, now, normally in the past, I would have tried to fill these things out at the top. Right, it's like the 63rd Judicial District, and put a court address. But you know, I've learned that they want you to do that so that you put yourself in your own box. I'm not doing it. I'm going to start at number one, and we just go from there. Right, but so I'm the plaintiff, and there's the United States as the defendant. Care of the civil process clerk, United States Attorney's Office, at the address of the local United States Attorney's Office. Right, uh, civil action between, no, N.A., just an N.A. to all. And I have knowledge, belief about the facts stated in this affidavit. Yeah, I'm the plaintiff. The plaintiff's an individual and a sole proprietor. And I said that I'm a union member, specifically because, you know, I'm saying that the defendant, which is the United States, is an individual union. Right, the United States is a union, like the Soviet Union. It's a union of all these other states. Right? It's the United States of America. Right? With the T capitalized, the thing that was created under the Articles of Confederation. That wasn't strong enough, right? So they created this union instead. And that union allowed United, United States of America, King George's jurisdiction, under a treaty, Petey, right, to be in the United States. But the United States of America had to follow the Constitution. And they're not. And the reason they're not is because there's nobody who's taken an oath under the Constitution to enforce it. Right? Nobody's taken the oath satisfy the sixth article of the Constitution, so there's no constitutionally qualified officers of the United States. It's messed up, but that's you know what it is. So, anyways, I said it's a union. Right, they don't agree. They can, whenever they come to answer, they can say that they're not a union. But you know, for today, they're a union, just like they put in their paperwork and it got put in. Well, I'm putting in my paperwork. 
Uh, the dates of the claim arose 1-6-2022 because, you know, basically every day I wake up, it's another, it's a new, you know, a new violation. The amount of the claim is $200. Um, right, because that's what uh, the law allowed, right? Here we go, that any person who is ejected, put out of lands, tenements, right, and, or tenements, right, which is forcible, Lawful manner being afterwards held out, uh, actual damages or two hundred dollars. So you know, they gave it. They give you the number to use as the sum certain to put in. Uh, where are you? Here. Okay. Uh, and then what did I say? Well, I said MCL six hundred twenty nine eighteen damages for forcible entry and detainer. United States in matter and spirit have failed to provide a Republican form of government in Michigan guaranteed by the fourth article of the Constitution of the United States. By this act of bad faith, I am ejected from constitutional protections, identification, electoral franchise, civil status, veterans' privileges earned serving my country, control of my, my one share of the public trust, to name just a few of my damaged tenements. Uh, plaintiff understands, accepts, yep, yep, got that. Um... I believe that the defendant is not mentally competent, right? It has to be represented. And I believe the defendant is 18 years or older. And I do not know whether the defendant's in military service before a notary. And, you know, that was all it took. And so according to this instruction manual, right, this three-page document here is called Affidavit and Claim. All right, so if you go on the instructions, uh, who can file, file in a claim, what's it cost, file an affidavit and claim with the court, make arrangements for service. So that's what I wanted to do. And I said, I wanted to do this. To file with the court by mail, you need to decide how you want to have the affidavit and claim served on each defendant because you will need to include payment for service when you mail your claim to the court. Contact the court to find out what it will cost. Place all four copies of the signed and notarized affidavit and claim form, payment for the filing fee, payment for service, and one self-addressed postage paid envelope in an envelope addressed to the proper district court. Have the post office mail the package to the court. You know, so basically you got to send them four copies of this right here. The, the original that has the notary and then three other copies with a check to cover the cost of the filing and the $10 for the service and a self-addressed envelope. Well, Monday they'll have it, right? And so I'm waiting, you know, obviously I'm waiting to see, well, what are they going to do with this? Will they take mine and take it to the federal court also? Right, so... Too early to tell, but I wanted to do the video on what had happened so far so that, uh, you know, the stuff, the weeks get busy real quick. So, all right, and just uh, before I finish, this is what Webster had to say about union, right? Uh, the act of joining two or more things into one, thus forming a compound body or a mixture, junction coalition of things that are united, uh, one kingdom, joy of the union with, uh, without end. Uh, we're states united. Thus, the United States of America are sometimes called the Union. But that's not United States of America as the name of something. That's the United States. Where are they? They're in America. Not the United States of, you know, South America or someplace else. So, in other words, this isn't the name of something. It's a description of something. But that's what it is, right? The United States of America or the United States, as I'm saying, is a Union. So I'm going to call it that. And uh, just real quick, uh, Article 4 of the Constitution, Section 4, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion. And on application of legislature or the executive when legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. So there you go. See, if I, if I was being properly seen, I'd be an elector. I'd be a member of the legislature. Or I could be a member of the executive. I guess you'd be a member of the exec executive. But because I'm not being seen, because they haven't you know, 
complied with this section. Somebody has suppressed all of my uh, vital records and so forth and so on. Things I've covered, you know, in many videos. So, you know, this is the reason I'm bringing them to court. Okay, well, we'll see what they do with that. And in the meantime, we saw what's happened with Tammy's case. Um, that's interesting also. Got a couple of foreclosure cases I'll cover in a separate video. It's just too much to cover at one time, and it all run together, so that's not so good. And uh, we'll leave it at that. So where am I? Right here. Notice Esquire's blank. Whatever it is, whatever they just put in, Whatever the last piece of paper is they put in, or the first piece of paper they put in, it violates Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 11B, or your state's version of that, whatever it ends up being. Okay, other than that, I'm going to leave it, and uh, you all have a great evening, great weekend, and uh, God bless. See you. Bye-bye.